today, Dr. Martin Sherrick, who I'm so glad to have back again. Um, nothing like your presence in this time to make me feel happy. And well, thank you, sweetie. It's you are you are a beacon of you are a beacon of light. This has been a rough week. Yeah. Yeah, and I think for the kind of doer personality, it, we want to stay productive and finding ways to be positive and productive right now are really hard, yeah. are really hard. And I wanted to start tonight by saying that um, I wrote a blog post earlier this week that if you scroll down the feed, you'll see as a little time bomb that everyone has, myself maybe more than others, a shorter fuse than normal. Um, I was talking about uh, stress stacking and um, how we're, you know, just by waking up in the morning in the world that we're living in, we're kind of starting pretty close to anyone's threshold or maybe over a threshold um, before we even get out of bed in the morning. So uh, if you hear something tonight that you disagree with or find irritating or maddening or something, um, you know, let me know in the most constructive way that you can and we will address your feelings and your comments. Um, so tonight we were gonna talk about what's happening in the world of veterinary medicine um, under these crazy circumstances. Yeah, because originally, even just things have changed so rapidly just over the week when we talked about this just earlier this week about, you know, you invited me to participate again. Um, thank you. Thank you. I, um, you know, I thought, well, you know, and I asked you who you were inviting and you'd said you were inviting Tika, which is, you know, an amazing association. Yeah. Yeah, no, Tika uh, is is that is to have uh, you know we thought I thought I'd like to talk about starting off on the right foot. So um, healthcare, preventative care from kittenhood on, and setting a good foundation for life. And then as the as uh, over the last few days, it became it, it became clear to me that's completely one hundred percent irrelevant or or at this moment in time, and that instead what we need to be doing is looking at um, uh, in the in this time of social distancing that the fact that we need to physically maintain distance and stay at home um, uh, and and keep our frontline workers who include um, uh, healthcare workers of all fields including in veterinary medicine safe um, is to uh, know when what's important like when is it important to take your cat in to the clinic like what is really really relevant and so to that, that became important to me because a week ago on Sunday, I noticed that my, uh, the love of my life, uh, Nimitz, who is, uh, you know, happens to have four legs and a very ginger coat, um, and who actually is an, the number one brat in, um, in our family. He, um, you know, just went off his food and he was uh, uh, feeling kind of, punky and uh, I thought his face looked a little swollen. Um, I was you know worried about uh, uh, worried about him. And like so many veterinarians, um, we are unable to see things clearly when it's our own cats. Um, and that's actually one of the rules in human medicine is that you don't treat your family and for good reason. Um, and it's and so I um, you know reached out to uh, Angie, who I, uh, you know, did a, a, a Dr. Angie Beeble, who, um, a, if she would have a, a look at him, um, and I felt really badly about it because this is not, you know, was not at that time an emergency. So, um, following, you know, to f fast forward a week, like because he he picked up and he was doing fine, but fast forward a week and uh, he his face blew up. Mm -hmm. And so under normal circumstances, I would be thinking, oh, an abscess. But, you know, his eye was completely swollen shut. All, everything was, was blown up completely off his food, just dropping muscle like crazy. And he's a small old cat to begin with. So very worried about that. And uh, uh, so th th because the, uh, at uh, the, the clinic that I take him to, he, uh, they, they, it's strictly a dental clinic. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, I, he was... Um, they're doing practicing physical distancing and not seeing routine appointments. So I had to take him um, in a carrier, leave the carrier at the door, you know, have the carrier be taken into the clinic, essentially, you know, be completely separated from him and, and not see 
not be able to interact. Whereas normally, uh, unlike other clients, um, I would be able to, I'd be in the back, I'd be, you know, assisting, I'd be all this sort of thing. So really quite mm, difficult emotionally uh, to have that break in being able to see him. And, and, and I, you know, it was just by the phone and I was thinking, okay, if this is just an abscess, then, uh, you know, they'll, she'll tell me really quickly. I mean, I couldn't touch it. If he, if he was febrile, et cetera, all classic, classic for abscess, but he's an old cat and he's the cat of a veterinarian. And, um, so, and he's my baby. So, mm -hmm. you know, you think it's the worst of the worst. And so sure enough, she gets in there and she, she, she lets me know, she texts me or calls me. I can't remember which it's done to say, yes, they had gotten some pus off. So I'm going, Oh, thank goodness. But why? But she couldn't find a puncture wound, no entry wound whatsoever. She shaved his face. She looked as carefully in his mouth. She'd taken skull radiographs. She'd taken dental radiographs to see if there was, a, if it was a, uh, uh, a root canal that was an issue or whether it was a, uh, which you wouldn't expect in a cat to blow up their face like that, uh, unlike a person or what, what it was. And they all that looked clean. So she, uh, because he had also had a, um, this is where I was naughty, because he also had a root resorption on the opposite side of his face uh, that we we knew about. I asked her if she could before she woke him up because they have to be anest anesthetized, of course, for x-rays. Um, and, and also just to look in his mouth because he was too painful. Could she just remove that? So she did. And on the x-ray, she had seen another root resorption on this side. So she, when she went to remove that tooth, all the other teeth wobbled and just about fell out. So she extracted those other teeth. And so hearing that, I'm thinking, well, there's two things that can be. One, cancer. And two, um, uh, you know, and, and, and number two was um, uh, osteomyelitis. Really rare. Okay, but bone, bone infection. And so I, you know, I mean, I had already, when I dropped him off in the morning, I'd said, if it's cancer, you know, if it looks like it's cancer, euthanize him right away. You know, I don't want, you know, we're not going through any, any chemo or anything like that because there is nothing to treat squamous cell carcinoma, which is the most common type of cancer in a cat's mouth. And if it were osteosarcoma, I don't want the, that half, you know, I don't want a mandible or, 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 or maxilla, you know, ha uh, half of it removed. So, so at this point, you know, she was really shocked. She and one of the other dentists went over the, all the radiographs, couldn't see anything, et cetera. So she, uh, he, you know, he came home, he's had a, he has had a rough couple of days. They did biopsy bone. I don't have those results back yet, but everything else looks like it. And he's improved really, really well. And so it does look like it was an abscess. Um, but why those, all those teeth just essentially fell out, I don't know. I'm not completely out of the woods. But so this is the sort of thing where, which really made me think, you know, um, oh my God, we need to talk about when do they need to go in? Because I was feeling badly about it. Well, you know, it's probably just an abscess and it hopefully will turn out that it was just an abscess. But even so, he was very sick. He was completely not eating. He was melting off muscle. He had a fever. I had started him on, on antibiotics, on appropriate antibiotics, but I only buy in injectable antibiotics because I couldn't get anything into his mouth. And so, you know, what we're talking pain, we're talking, you know, serious uh, and cats have to eat so often. So uh, not eating for three days is it just doesn't just doesn't cut it. So that's why I thought this would be a good a good topic and a good a good jumping off point. Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, I'm so sorry. And I'm glad he's doing better. And I'll be eager to wait for those results. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, we kind of wear two hats, one as veterinarian and then the other as, as pet parent. Okay. And um, when we're the veterinarian, we have to be objective and think about how we're going to get all the things done. And when we switch roles into the pet parent, it's really shocking to us sometimes, to me anyway. I lost my cat this um, this past, it's actually almost a year ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And I found myself very surprised at how emotional that I was. Yeah. Um, he had a, a acute um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and went from fine that I had no idea to dead in, in a couple hours. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was so emotional. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. like, you know how this works, you know how it goes, but yet, like, that doesn't matter at all. And it makes me think about how, you know, I kind of started this by saying we were all sort of um just hoping with what's going on in our world we're all so stressed 
And then you add oh, better. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll be as tall as you. But, um, <laughs> then you add the worry of uh, you know your beloved pet, and it's it's almost too much. And now you know from the pet parent side, just like you said, you normally would be going in there, so you you don't want to miss telling the vet something that might be important, and you want to see how the cat is doing, and you can't do any of those things. And you want to be there to reassure your cat and to reassure yourself. And so it's just so hard and so completely foreign yeah. to what we're used to. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to explain a little bit about why that is, other than the obvious of, um, you know, we're not supposed to be near each other, but also the whole veterinary experience on the, on the practitioner side, we're just jammed right up next to each other. We're jammed up right up next to our technicians to try to get things done. Um, you end up being in, in extremely, particularly with a teeny little cat, you you end up being in really close proximity. So you know if somebody hasn't brushed their teeth. Let's put it that way, shall we? Yeah. Yeah, a little mm, onions for lunch. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, you you just by the nature of your job, which is something that I never thought think about in regular day, you're really, really close to people all the time. Yep. And now we're now, you know, the recommendations are kind of evolving. As I've spoken about before with the novel virus, we can't be shocked when we learn something new or different every day. The science is evolving as fast as it can. And the, re the recommendations and information that we're getting feels like it's changing all the time. Even this week um, here, I was hearing six feet isn't enough. Um, that, you know, you could catch this just by talking to someone who's asymptomatic, all those things. So for the staff at the veterinary hospital, just being there is dangerous, even when the pet parent is not in the room. Well, and it, additionally, you know, the, the clinics are running into the same um, uh, dilemmas uh, as uh, uh, that the uh, non-veterinary hospitals, uh, in, in, namely regarding supply and availability of personal protective equipment. Um, you know, we can't get hold of surgical masks for love or money, and so there's now all these. You know, how to how to sew your own masks, and I'm gonna I'm just tearing my hair out over all these mask posts and trying to set people straight. And you know, no, a cloth mask will not work. Um, so it, it you know it not only doesn't protect you, it doesn't protect others. And it's just, you know, so, you know, we've got, we've got the, the, the masks issues. We've got, um, the, uh, um, you know, gloves, the washing hands, all these sorts of, all these sorts of, uh, things. And, and, Dr. Scott, we published some really great, you know, summarized some really great stuff, which you've linked to. I put the, yeah, yeah, yeah linked there. And essentially, you know, whenever possible, stay at least two meters or six feet apart. We can't always do it, but we have to make it our goal. If a procedure will necessitate close contact between people, such as blood collection or urine collection or catheter placement, pretty much anything that involves holding an animal, uh, take a moment to step back and think about whether the procedure is really needed. Or if and or if there's alternative ways of accomplishing the same thing that don't really doesn't require multiple people. When people have to be close together, be efficient. Get everything set up in advance so that whatever needs to be done can be done quickly. Uh, try to keep contact groups together. So if you know you little mini mini teams. Um, so if people have to work in close proximity at times, uh, there it helps to keep the number of different combinations of people in close contact to a minimum. Look at the clinic layout and operations to see if people who normally sit near each other can be separated. Um, you know, uh, lounge, uh, reception, lounge, lunchroom, office spaces, whatever. Uh, move people around, schedule things that only one person is in a room at a time. Wherever possible, make sure all staff are paying attention to their health and staying home if they're sick. Really, 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 really important. And that means, you know, a, a clinic may be down somebody for two weeks or maybe two people for down for two weeks and maybe it's a, a clinic of only three people. You know, what do you do then? Encourage uh, staff to be responsible outside of work uh, with social distancing or physical distancing, as I insist on calling it, at all times to protect coworkers and practice good routine infection control measures like hand hygiene, cleaning and disinfection of high contact surfaces. Masks, he's, you know, he says to, um, Masks can reduce the risk of transmission if someone is unknowingly shedding the virus. They're not perfect, but they can be of some benefit. Whether it's a good use of masks or not is questionable. 
putting on masks for occasional close contact procedures and ideally reusing that mask for the whole ship isn't unreasonable, but whether it's really worth the mask is- and, uh, This is something where I just have to pause as a trained medical professional. This is, I think one thing that um, if you're uh, not in the medical profession, it's really hard to um, imagine what strain this is on the professionals because we go through, I, I was describing, you know, I had a whole semester, if I'm remembering correctly, it was more than a few years ago, a whole semester on sterile technique where we were taught how to put on that equipment and take it off over and over and over. And then when you progress into your clinic year, you are observed putting that on being appropriate during a procedure and taking it off uh, for another year. So the training for how to properly use this equipment, put it on, use it while it's on and take it off. It seems like a mask, it's just sitting there, but it's it's not, as if you touch it. It's you, no longer a mask. It's no longer a mask. Yes. And the stress of not, A, if medical professionals not having it at all right now is just unfathomable. Then, you know, in, in normal times, if you are in an isolation situation, which in any other time, every single COVID patient would be an isolation patient. We would gown and glove and mask to and go booties. and booties. And I mean, it's like a whole space suit in a very regimented procedure yeah. to go into every room and we would take it off and, and dispose of it in a proper container. Then we would clean ourselves and then we would dress in a whole new outfit to go into the next room. Yeah. And that's how veterinarians are trained and doctors are trained. So it's not just like suggested or recommended. I mean, we, this is drilled into us. Yeah. And now because of a lack of supplies, that is not possible. So we know when we are reusing this equipment that but we are not inside. You cry inside. You cry inside. Yeah, you cry inside. And and then so you know that brings us to then well what you know what for what should you take your cat in? And again, Dr. Weiss again in the links um, uh, talks about and this is this is going to uh, differ from place to place to some degree, but I'll just sort of go over things that are routinely you know yeah. wellness visits postponed. Absolutely. Um, food sales and medication refills should be fine, but with with physical distancing. Um, and, you know, that's going to depend on the comfort level of, of the clinic uh, and delivery or e-commerce or something like that should, should is, is, is better used. Um, rabies vaccinations, certainly, you know, where you are, they're mandatory. Where I am in British Columbia, they're not. But wherever they're mandatory, those things have to continue. Okay, and um, other, whereas other vaccinations, no, okay, that is now, you know, because we're supposed to be keeping our, our critters indoors anyway, um, uh, and we're mostly the ones that put them at risk by our going out for our indoor animals. Our indoor animals do need to be vaccinated, but right now that has to be, that has to slide. Heartworm prophylaxis, again, that depends on, on the area, but again, that can, you know, testing should be postponed, but certainly using, um, uh, dispensing the, you know, the medications, the heartworm prophylaxis can continue. Flea and tick preventive, same thing, uh, can continue. Now, uh, when it comes to surgeries, um, you know, there's uh, routine surgeries, obviously, no, or, or elective surgeries, no, elective dental hygiene, no, I'm probably, you know, you, like me, like my husband, um, have been, uh, you know, have been told by our dentists that no, your hygiene has to, has to wait. Uh, they're, you know, they're, that's another group where they're right in your face all the time. And they're at, at constant, constant risk. Um, so lack of materials, their supplies is, 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 uh, is, is a real problem. So you should take them in for life threatening conditions. Absolutely. So if it's somebody, uh, um, if they are, um, you know, somebody is, is, uh, vomiting nonstop or is is uh, is running a, a fever that doesn't break on its own see and i have the advantage i was able to give them some sub q fluids at home and start them on antibiotics at home and 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 uh you know syringe feed him at home uh, although he wouldn't take it because his mouth hurt too much and all these sorts of things i i, I knew knew what to do and i had some of the supplies that i needed but um so and management of painful conditions uh those those things 
that, you know, Margaret, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at my face as you're speaking, which I usually don't do, and I just have this constant grimace on because we, we it's a really tough time, yeah. and people don't have the money cash flow that they did three exactly. months, weeks ago. So not not only do you have all the other emotional stress and the worry about um, you know exposure, but also that financial stress. And so I think that th this is a point in veterinary medicine that I think about quite a bit. So do you wait and hope it gets better and that you don't have to go into the vet? Or do you call earlier and say, this is going on because if I don't deal with it now, it may end up a much bigger, much more expensive issue. And that judgment call is really tough. It's really <laughs> tough because you know, in the, we, we're so used to telling people Prevention, an ounce of prevention, you know, is, is worth a pound of cure. D deal with things um, early because there will be less suffering and less cost involved, um, and less time to to, to recovery, etc. But it, so when we're talking, you know, we have to really talk with people on the phone um, uh, via, you know, via uh, 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 doing telemedicine. That's going to really, really help through Zoom, through FaceTime, this sort of thing where it, that, you know, our, our clients need to understand that's what they have to expect. And that is a big change all of a sudden. So people are getting like me, if you guys watched the first few videos, like I have no idea what I'm doing with this technology. I got it now, but uh, for most of it, not for the fancy stuff, but um, you know, the technology is new, the flow of information and how your vet might handle that. This is all new for everybody while we're under stress, which is not the way we like to start new things. So if everybody can try to be patient and show patient. some grace. Patient. patient, and also recognize that, you know, that uh, recognizing that this is just, it's not just stressful for you. You're not, you know, it's your baby, absolutely. And you want to be with them and, it's and you're financially stressed as well because I think we all are. I certainly am massively financially stressed right now because my job is traveling the world and lecturing. Guess what? So yeah, poof, all gone. And so to recognize also that the flip side of it is is that the veterinarians are stressed to the T, um, and the teams. Whenever I say veterinarians, I mean the entire team um, is stressed to the max too. They're trying to figure out how to do their job, do what they're follow their passion, take care of your loved ones, um, stay healthy and stay financially afloat. It is a huge stress. It's a huge stress. So life-threatening conditions, um, the, the, it, you know, the, most likely that the patient will have to, have to go in, uh, but certainly um, the client cannot come in. Um, uh, management of painful conditions managed by telemedicine wherever possible. Um, so through videos and what, looking about if the cat or, or dog needs to be examined and uh, then, you, and, the, and they're from a low risk household. Okay, again, now we're talking about if, you're, if you've got a cat or a dog who's coming from a household where there's suspicion or, um, or confirmation of COVID-19 in that household, there is a, a, albeit small, but it does up the risk for handling that handling that dog or cat. Yeah, yeah, and I think this is something that again the science is evolving as fast as it can. Gosh, every day. And we we don't want to alarm people, and we don't want anybody surrendering their pet because of That's these fears. Yeah. We don't have good science for yet, but if you are sick for any reason. Um, you would want to tell your veterinarian if, you're, if your pet has to go in and anyone in your house is sick, it is fair to tell your veterinarian that information so they can use extra precaution handling your pet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, management of chronic conditions, same thing, uh, preferably via telemedicine. But if they do have to be examined, then so be it. Surgical pain procedures for painful disorders. If the pain can't be controlled as, uh, uh, you know, through temporarily through analgesia and temporarily, I mean, we're talking probably at least another eight weeks now. So uh, then with low risk of negative consequences, delay the surgery. Otherwise, you know, you're, they're going to have to stay in probably that, you know, depending on the risk associated with the household, the animal may need to be 
isolated from all other animals. They're going to have to stay in for longer because you can't be, and there's no visitation. Um, and then chemotherapy, for instance, uh, that's something that if somebody is receiving chemo, that needs to continue. Um, if somebody hasn't started yet, then you need to look at the risks of waiting um, versus starting and, 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 con mate and continuing. So, I mean, he's come up with some really good, you know, really good, good guidelines. Um, and, you know, quit with the, I remember seeing some posts saying, what is it with people bringing their dogs in for nail trims? No nail trims right now. No nail trims, really. No grooming, no grooming. No, no nail trims. I, want, I want to talk about this for a second because Nails that are getting long can actually grow, particularly in cats, particularly. grow around into the pad. And so let's all start today. You know, in fact, tomorrow maybe I will grab something and start showing you with Phoebe on the video. But um, let's start. And please quit with the cat nail clippers. Cat nail clippers are round and they crush nails. Look at a cat's nail. Look at a dog's nail. A dog's nail is round in circumference. A cat's nail is like ours. It's flat. It just comes out at the other angle, but it's flat. So use toenail clippers. That is a great tip. And almost everyone has them. And if not, you can probably, if you, order, cheap, them, cheap. If you order them on Amazon, you'll get them eventually. And yeah. I will start showing people how you can spread some wet food or a treat and start right now with positive reinforcement, like a, a very cat friendly handling technique. Yeah. That if you start this over time in some number of weeks, you're going to be able to trim most cats nails in a positive way. And that's something we would all benefit from learning and do it together now before the nails are a problem. So I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna get you that for tomorrow where I'll start with my cat and then we can all do it together. Um, because uh, these kinds of things that we need to be doing, don't get yourself bit either. Yeah. Um, a cat bite to a human being uh, is very, very, very serious and almost always needs antibiotics. And so we don't wanna be having any humans in the emergency room that don't need to be. My other, if we talk about grooming, my cat has long hair. And I think probably every veterinarian out there has seen uh, the very well-meaning client who picks up the cat mat and cuts only they got the skin because when a mat is very tight, it's really close to the skin. And it's very hard to tell where the mat ends and the skin starts. And when you, I'm going to do it with my shirt. If you, oh, it's all black. You can't see. Maybe, here, I can do it. You can yeah, you it. That oh, up, and you just cut this little tip off. When you drop it back down, that tip is now huge. Yeah. And you're and like, you suture, you're suture glue and you feel guilty and your cat's walking around with an open wound and it's just, just don't get a, get a wide tooth metal comb. Metal combs are the best because they actually get down to the skin. Brushes don't combs do. And you can, you know, work, work mats out. And, and I also love if you feel you have to trim a mat out the little, they're called beard trimmers. So they're much smaller than a big clipper and they don't make much noise or vibration. And that's another thing that we can show you tomorrow with taking um, a treat nicely, a, a wet treat or some wet food smeared on something nicely. And uh, and so then your cat will get used to the, the clipper and it won't be so quick. Um, but no scissors and cats. No scissors. And um, I what I have with mine and my guys should start should come running at any moment hearing me with this. Whenever I do their nails, I have a, this is the treat container. Here comes one. And so when I, they, they're going to get their nails trimmed, you know, but they come running because they, they're hearing um, the treats. And so you don't can't expect positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement, but it's, it's earned over time. <laughs> you're going to get to run after these as exercise instead. Ah, here comes number two. Here you go. They're getting exercise instead of nails trimmed right now. I mean, we want to reward that rather than me just saying, well, I was just demoing you guys too bad. You don't get treats right now. Yeah. Yeah. This stuff, is, I think we really need to start thinking about this. And I'm actually going to maybe figure out if I can get for dogs too some at home kind of band aid grooming ideas for people because two, three, four weeks, okay. 
But if we're, you know, in parts of the country where we may be not safe to go to the market for long periods of time, we're, we're going to start, that becomes a health issue. And so- Wait, wait, wait. Did you, did you just say in parts of the country? Is, does that, is that like saying, that's like saying, that's like saying that in a swimming pool, there's a section, there's a P section. Being yeah. Section. So- well, so, I mean, uh, it, social distancing is now recommended for everyone in the United States of America. Uh, but how long it's going to go on and where, I think is still a question mark. Um, I'm not a ray of sunshine when it comes to this topic. I'm uh, not going to politics, shall we? Can I, we can I, we can may I, be left Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. It was a lot to make up for lost time. Um, yeah. I wanted to also talk about subtle signs of sickness though too because cats hide their illnesses and I actually yeah. talked about this last week on Thursday um and so I'm gonna send you just a uh oh well there's I, I gave you another link to that yeah have we seen your cat yeah. .com. in there there's the the 10 subtle signs of sickness and um they're everything from uh, inappropriate elimination you know what for cat uh, is urinating or defecating somewhere other than in their litter box they're trying to tell you something and it could be that they're trying to tell you that they're psychologically distressed, um, which we talked about last week also, you know, that the meeting their environmental needs. It could be telling you that they have a physical um, ailment um, that is uh, that, that is causing them distress um, um, as well. If they're not going, thank goodness they pee outside the box because otherwise we would assume they were well if they just kept using the box. Um, a cat who is obstructed, for instance, uh, isn't going to be peeing outside the box. They may be peeing only small amounts outside the box. But if you see, and this is why clumping litter is so great, if you see in an open, unhooded box, if you see lots of little clumps in there rather than one large clump, be concerned because your cat's got some degree of obstruction. It could be that there's spasm of the urethra so the urine can't go through it, or it could be that there's a plug in the urethra so nothing get, can get past it. But that that is an emergency. For that, you do need to get them in, even in this era of COVID-19. And, and to that same point, if your cat's all of a sudden spending a lot of time in the litter box, yes. uh, that, that they and have- Under their tail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah these are all signs that, that you at least call your vet. Yeah, exactly. Uh, really, that this is it, right? Call your vet if you don't, if you don't know. Uh, changes in interaction, like Nimitz said, changes in activity, changes in sleeping habits, same thing there. Changes in food and water consumption, also, you know, Nimitz, three days before, you know, last week. Um, unexplained weight loss or gain, well, he wasn't eating, therefore he was losing weight, but what was, un what was, un what alarmed me was how much muscle he was losing. And that's, so I'll talk about muscle condition in, in a moment, but the, with losing that much muscle, um, I'm, I get very concerned about not just inadequate calories, but you know, could this be something like cancer or could it be something like, uh, and so that, that another reason for, for concern there changes in like increased weight would also be a concern because that could be fluid in the abdomen, um, uh, or, or from from less likely heart disease in in the case of cats, but it can be, um, and uh, or in, in in the abdomen where it could be from a lot of different reasons. Changes in grooming, stopping grooming. You know, Nimitz was busy grooming himself today. I sent a video of that to you know to uh, Angie because uh, it's like yes, he's grooming again. Signs of stress, changes in vocalization. You know, the the, the character or the or the tone and. Uh, you know, bad breath, uh, also a, 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 a real concern. So, and not just because his teeth aren't pretty, but because it could be something from his airways, something from his stomach, you know, his, his GI tract, or also something from, um, uh, uh, you know, in this case, uh, you know, concern about cancer. You touched on water consumption too, but I just wanted to circle back to that because if all of a sudden you're filling the cat bowl, it used to be once or twice a day, now it's three or four times a day, that is significant. That's yeah that you're, you want to you wanna let your vet know about too. Yes. Um, we, we talked about, uh, I'm sorry, we talked about uh, urine in the litter box, but also feces. So if all of a sudden you're like, oh great, two days, no poop. That's not great. Not great at all. And watch the character of the, of the feces too, because mm -hmm. the feces used to be nice, nice moist log, maybe dried out because it's in, been in the litter, but, but um, still it's a log versus uh, it's hard pellets more like, you know, rabbit pellets, 
bit bigger than that, but still rabbit pellets, then, you know, be concerned. You've got somebody who is very dehydrated and dehydration is bad. It makes everything worse. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the hiding, I think, is a big one, too. If all if you're just not seeing them, don't presume yeah. that that's okay. Yeah. Often, and often that's the only thing we see. Mm -hmm. You just didn't see me at the door like they used to. And now, now we don't even have that, you know? And you're stressed and you're doing your own thing. And all of a sudden, like, wow, you know, that where is the cat? Yeah. That's, that's a thing that, you know, these subtle behavior changes. We And also something well, that... They're tripping over them. Normally, you don't see them. And now, all of a sudden, they're underfoot. You know, they're just lying there quietly. What the heck? I don't know if the average cat parent can appreciate color too of the yellow. Maybe that's too much to ask. But um, but if you if you look at the their the insides of the skin part of their ears um, and their eyes and all of a sudden like hmm is that different? We want to know that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we may ask you to you know look at the roof of the mouth. We may you know certainly at the conjunctiva, but yeah, having a look at those things for sure. Yeah. But weight, weight's a really, really, also really, really good key. Not the number itself, but the change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you say, uh, I'll go in pounds for you rather than kilos. Well, um, you know, Mark is in Canada and I'm here. Yeah. In Canada, so. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's say, you know, your cat used to be 11 pounds and is 10 pounds. And, you know, he was a little heavy at 11 pounds, but he's not really been on any diet per se, or if nothing's really changed, and he's 10 pounds, you go, oh, well, that's good, right? Well, no, because if not, if you haven't, if you haven't reduced the amount of food or like deliberately or changed the type of food or increased his running down the hall after treats or whatever, then you need to be um, concerned about, uh, about illness. And because while it's only one pound, do we have a tail here? Yes. <laughs> Why is it only one pound? This is Harvey. 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 Aww, Harvey's beautiful. This and Harvey looks so thrilled. Um, anyways, uh, if uh, you know one pound coming from eleven pounds is almost ten percent of his weight, which you know on me that would be like fourteen pounds. You're not supposed to lose that without trying. No, and certainly not. Well, you know, he's just kind of been off his feet. He hasn't been quite right for the last for the last three days. I can't lose fourteen pounds in three days. Clearly, it's been going on for a lot longer. Yeah, and he's been hiding it because that's what cats do. Yeah, that's what cats do. So this is why a percentage weight change is so much more valuable than an actual number. Um, also, there's you know links to and we can you could post them eh, for to the WSAVA body condition score and muscle condition score uh, images. Those are very very helpful. Again, looking at the trends, following the trends. Yeah, and and in this time when it may be more difficult to get to the vet, um, put it, make sure you put your hands on your cat every day so you're starting to notice changes. You know, right. it's um, it's a strange time. It's yeah. a but the the uh, the phone call is always your first best option. Yeah. And um, I, I again want to circle back every single time that, that we're on Facebook to say, please do not give your cat any medication that was not prescribed for them by your veterinarian without asking your veterinarian. If they oh that such and so is wrong and didn't the other pet have this and maybe I can give that or what about a human medicine or let me just try this. That can be catastrophic. Yeah. So one quick phone call, your vet would rather answer that phone call and explain to you what's safe and what isn't than you, like, oh, I don't want to bother them. And then you end up maybe doing something that is even deadly. So one, one more thing to that point. With telemedicine yeah. and with doing the, <laughs> you're actually, I just thought, we, you know, seeing how I've got a cat here. <laughs> You should include him in the picture. Um, I'm allergic to cats. Did you know that? I'm yes. Well, a, and you're rubbing your nose. A, you're touching your face, but B, you're rubbing your nose, and the cat is is um four thousand miles away. Yeah. Okay. Way to go. Um. Anyway, uh, the uh with respect to telemedicine, I also have seen a couple of posts uh, where veterinarians have been very upset that clients have been unwilling to pay and are or are offended that they're expected to pay when 
it was, uh, they didn't actually, the, the veterinarian didn't actually lay hands on the cat. Sorry, guys. You know, it's still the skill, care, and judgment, years of years of, of training, the judgment that has come through the years of practice um, to assess, and it's so much harder, you know, through to elicit a good history from clients to try and, you know, find out what's going on and to ask what to ask them to look for um, without the cat in the room. You know, please don't give your veterinarian grief about paying, uh, you know, being asked to pay for this. It's such a, it's such a hard time for everyone. Um, and we are, we're like I said, we, things change really fast and we don't have a chance necessarily to roll things out the way we would like to and set expectations properly and people are short tempered. Um, it's definitely a time for deep breaths and grace uh, before you get upset um, or angry, and uh, every uh, the, the people who need to spend money are short on cash, and the people who need to keep their businesses going um, are on cash. Really, really hurting too. So um, there's not easy answers here, um, no. and but I think being open and honest and caring and um, about each other is our best hope at getting through this. Um, as well as we can to, as a community of animal people to care for each other um, and meet each other's needs as best we can. Uh, you know, I, I think that we, with better communication, uh, we can do that. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's, I mean, because we really do need everybody to stay, stay, stay at home. Um, as much as as much as possible to get through this for another couple of months, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'm not an epidemiologist, but um, not an expert in the in this area. Uh, but it's it's something that you know. On, on top of all of this, like you talked about s stress stacking, we also have the issue that veterinarians we're not used to doing telemedicine, most of us, and now we're having to figure out how the apps work and how all this stuff works and how do we get how do we ask a client you know well I can't see your dog or cat they're not in the picture you know can you please move your computer or can you get oh you don't have anybody there to hold the phone for you I, like you know, so it's that much more complicated than what might otherwise have been a 10 minute and at this point now the cat's getting right royally annoyed and is turning around and biting the person because you know you can, it's all taking longer and now yeah, so patience kindness and communication yeah yeah and and we're gonna get through it we are going yeah. to get through it and i i keep hoping very much that this experience makes us get through it and be Finder, better, smarter people on the other side, um, not angrier, more short tempered, nastier people on the other side. I kind of insist upon it. <laughs> Somehow, some way, we were, are all going to have our ups and downs, but um, this kind of thing has to make us better, not worse. Yeah. Um, and the animals are a big part of that. Um, I know I have always loved having my animals in my life, but right now, having my dog and cat are um, essential amazing gifts to this time. Really amazing gifts to this time. And tomorrow night, I'm gonna be talking with Dr. Laird Goodman from the Human Animal Bond Foundation. And a question that I have for him, I know you're gonna know, you're gonna- What a great organization. And I'm excited to learn more about it. I don't really know that much about it. So I'm gonna be learning with everybody else. About 25 years old now, yeah. My question that I can't wait to ask him is I think we focus so much on what our pets do for us. But when we say human animal bond, we don't just mean the animal exclusively gives to us in exchange for food and water. What are we giving back to them to make sure that we are a part of that bond, not just a taker in that relationship? And, um, and I am looking forward to having the opportunity to ask that question. I wanna at least inject that notion into the consciousness of the people who um, are interested in what I have to say. It can't just all be about us. And what and what uh, what time is that? Sounds like a perfect way, right? Yeah, what time is that? Tomorrow. That'll be at nine o'clock Eastern tomorrow okay. night. Steve Dale's gonna join me too and awesome. he's in the Chicago area. So he we're all coming from different time zones and uh, it's all crazy. But the, the one I, I I just go by Eastern time when I announce so nine o'clock Eastern 
tomorrow night. Um, and that's going to be great. And I, I'm pretty sure that Alona is going to come on on Sunday awesome. night. Dr. Alona Rodan, oh, damn. The esteemed and amazing Dr. Alona Rodan, um, uh, to talk on Sunday night. So it's going to be a great weekend. Um, and I know me and everybody else out there is hoping, or I should say I, my dad, if he's listening at home, is really mm. uh, disappointed in me. Uh, I hope that Nimitz is, is turning the corner. You, <laughs> we hope Nimitz is turning the corner. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think he has. I'm just waiting for that histopath. We got the histopath on the soft tissue was favorable. I just need that that bone to decalcify so that it can be read ASAP. So a couple more days there. Trust, yeah, a couple, couple more days on that. The And, you know, culture, we're doing an anaerobic culture right now as well. So from the broth subculture, doing everything we freaking can. It, it also um, really uh, helps having a husband um, who is a clinical pathologist. So oh, did you? how did I not know that? A veterinary clinical pathologist? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I get this elusive man. Yeah. Maybe yeah. We should have one come on and talk about ClinPath. <laughs> <laughs> it's riveting. It's riveting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, maybe maybe we'll see you next week. Well, I look forward to I'd love to see, I want to see you doing a, a grooming and nail thing. Yeah. 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 Yes. I started doing training with both my pets. I'm surprised about it. Um, I, I uh, had a great talk with Tabitha Kusera, mm -hmm. um, who uh, she has like 50 million letters behind her name. That I'm dyslexic, so they all start to come together for me. But she's an incredibly trained uh, veterinary technician um, who speaks all over the country um, on many, many topics, including behavior and fear-free practice and cat-friendly handling and all sorts of wonderful things. And she taught me uh, through the, this show about how to uh, target train. And yeah. I did that with both, I was really surprised because my dog is trained with voice commands. And so I started target training him and he keeps looking at me like, are you gonna talk to me or what? Yeah. Uh, Whereas I never trained Phoebe before, she's only about nine months old, and so uh, I'd never done any training with her before. Easy, it's easy. Get like that. Oh my gosh! I should, you know, when Nimitz is well, when Nimitz is well, I'll have to sh get, show you his. You know, like he'll touch right, he'll touch left, um, he'll high five, he'll low five, he'll, and he loves it. I mean, it's his way of getting something from me. You know, it's it. It, it's it, so it's a two way thing, just like you know you're talking about. It's not just because I absolutely don't want to train my cats. I think it's you know demeaning to train somebody to do tricks or anything. You know, right up there with zoo performances and things like that, circuses rather. Um, so it's that that thing that that doesn't appeal to me. But it actually it, it is interactive. It does engage them. They love the 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 fact that they can make me do something. By doing something. I think that for me, as you know, behavior is my true love and interspecies communication is endlessly fascinating and finding a uh, common ground where we can give and receive information clearly between humans and animals is a very blissful space for me. And, um, and I'm fascinated by that. I think how frustrating and scary it must be to be in someone else's world where they have control over everything and they have no idea what we're talking about and we're inconsistent and it must be so hard for them. And so I'm just endlessly fascinated with- well, I think it would be like being, being in a prison in a, in a foreign country. Yeah. Different culture, different food, different language, different, uh, you know, uh, just everything's different and your freedom has been taken away from you. Yeah. So giving a lot of thought to, um, as you know, that's my whole raison d'etre right now is doing that for cats uh, yeah. and maybe down the road for dogs too. So but for right now, um, we're going to try to keep everybody well. So I hope everyone who's watching is also safe and well. I feel um, just an incredible care and love for everyone at the moment. Uh, and uh, I would like to save the world. So I'm gonna keep trying to do that. <laughs> so sometimes I make messes too. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be talking with you soon, Margie, I hope. Okay. And uh, maybe we'll see you next week. Okay, ciao. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Stay safe.